Did you know that the founder of conservatism is known for the first ever work on philosophical anarchism? And if you are conservative, this might come as a surprise because the word anarchy may be associated with leftist type of thinking. But the word anarchy in Greek stems from an archon, which simply means no rulers. What if anarchism actually has its roots within conservatism? As you will see, I will read a vindication of natural society, which the Wikipedia even says to be the first literary expression of philosophical anarchism, while admitting that Edmund Burke, the writer of that text, is praised by both conservatives and liberals in the 19th century, and he was widely regarded, especially in the United States, as the philosophical founder of conservatism. So, I did research on the abolitionists, that is my main focus, is looking at the 19th century and looking at what history has to tell us. These are people who lived after the Founding Fathers, who warned us about the government that they created and how it would not actually work in our favor, as we see tyranny is growing in the world and the Constitution failed to keep government limited. They were actually very outspoken about this in ways that a lot of people today may, may consider extreme in such ways like saying, wait, what are you talking about? The Constitution, we need to return to that. We need to understand what the Founding Fathers were saying. These people were not nearly a hundred years after their time, and they said, look, our Founding Fathers, a lot of them were slave owners. They promoted slavery. They didn't see their own faults in their own writings, and so they're they made their own works dedicated to exposing what was happening. And so don't let this trigger you. Don't be like the left. Be open-minded to this information because this work is powerful. And if you're conservative, you might be surprised to hear that you might end up agreeing with philosophical anarchists and individualists and voluntarists more than you probably think because you've never actually heard of the term and it being used in this fashion. I talk about nature is the answer. Well, here, quite literally, is a text talking about how an artificial society, these governments we set up are not actually benefiting humankind. And he really gets down to the root cause of it, which again, a lot of people don't want to look at the moral, philosophical, psychological aspects to what's going on in this world. They want to look purely at the you know, political side of things, like let's change the laws, let's change the politicians, when here in this text, Burke is giving us a history of governments and how they operate and how dangerous they can be when people think that they're doing good, they're actually contributing to the greatest evil on earth. Even George Washington said that government is like fire, it's a dangerous servant and a fearful master. This text was also reproduced in the later abolitionist newspaper called Liberty, which its motto is liberty is the mother of order, not the daughter, to emphasize that freedom creates order, not chaos. And this was created by an individual named Benjamin Tucker. If you look at Rothbard and Tucker's analysis of this and just looking at the text for what it is by itself, this is not a piece of irony. And there's a lot of weird sayings being made, very strong claims if it was. You can judge for yourself and I'll have the whole text linked below because I couldn't find anybody who did any audio recording or audio book of this text actually. There were people who did, but it's not complete online. So I'll just have it linked below and we're just gonna look at excerpts from that text. This is political society and hence the sources of what are usually called states, civil societies, or governments into some form of which more extended or restrained all mankind have gradually fallen. The the fabric of superstition has in this our age and nation received much ruder shocks than it had ever felt before, and through the chinks and breaches of our prison we see such glimmerings of light and feel such refreshing airs of liberty as daily raise our order for more. The miseries derived to mankind from superstition under the name of religion and of ecclesiastical tyranny under the name of church government have been clearly and usefully exposed. We begin to think and to act from reason and from nature alone. This is true of several, but still is by far the majority in the same old state of blindness and slavery, and much is to be feared that we shall perpetually relapse whilst the real productive cause of all this superstitious folly, enthusiastical nonsense, and holy tyranny holds a reverent place in the estimation even of those who are otherwise enlightened. 
civil government borrows a strength from ecclesiastical, and artificial laws receive a sanction from artificial revelations. The ideas of religion and government are closely connected, and whilst we receive government as a thing necessary or even useful to our well-being, we shall, in spite of us, draw in as a necessary though undesirable consequence an artificial religion of some kind or other. To this vulgar will always be voluntary slaves, and even those of a rank of understanding superior will now and then involuntarily feel its influence. It is therefore of the deepest concernment to us to be set right in this point and to be well satisfied whether civil government be such a protector from natural evils and such a nurse and increaser of blessings as those of warm imaginations promise. I now come to show that political society is justly chargeable with much the greatest part of this destruction of the species. To give the fairest play to every side of the question, I will own that there is a haughtiness and fierceness in human nature which will cause immunerable broils. Place men in what situation you please, but owning this, I still insist in charging it to political regulations that these broils are so frequent, so cruel, and attended with consequences so deplorable. In a state of nature it has been impossible to find a number of men, yet the means that simple nature has supplied them with are by no means adequate to such an end. From the earliest dawnings of policy to this day, the inventions of men have been sharpening and improving the mystery of murder. From the first rude essays of clubs and stones to the present perfection of gunnery, canyoneering, bombarding, mining, and all these species of artificial learned and refined cruelty in which we are now so expert and which make a principal part of what politicians have taught us to believe is our principal glory. How far mere nature would have carried us, we may judge by the example of those animals who still follow her laws, and even of those to whom she has given dispositions more fierce and arms more terrible than ever she intended we should use. It is an incontestable truth that there is more havoc made in one year by men of men than there have been made by all the lions, tigers, panthers, ounces, leopards, hyenas, rhinoceroses, elephants, bears, and wolves upon their several species since the beginning of the world. Though these agree ill enough with each other and have a much greater proportion of rage and fury in their composition than we have, but with respect to you, you legislators, you civilizers of mankind, you Orpheus, uh, Moses, M Minosis, Solons, uh, Theosis, all these people he mentions, with respect to you, be it spoken, your regulation have done more mischief in cold blood than all the rage of the fiercest animals in their greatest terrors or furies have ever done or could ever do. These evils are not accidental. Whoever will take the pains to consider the nature of society will find they result directly from its constitution. The reciprocation of tyranny and slavery is requisite to support these societies. The interest, the ambition, the malice, or the revenge, nay, even the whim and caprice of one ruling male among them is enough to arm all the rest without any private views of their own to the worst and blackest purposes, and what is at once lamentable and ridiculous, these wrenches engage under those banners with a fury greater than if they were animated by revenge for their own proper wrongs. He talks about how slaughtering human history has been, and he says, I charge the whole of these effects on political society. He also says, I can never believe that any institution agreeable to nature and proper for mankind could find it necessary or even expedient in any case whatsoever to do what the best and worthiest instincts of mankind warn us to avoid. But no wonder that what is set up in opposition to the state of nature should preserve itself by trampling upon the law of nature. And he says, to prove that these sorts of policed societies are a violation offered to nature and a constraint upon the human mind, it needs only to look upon the sanguinary measures and instruments of violence which are everywhere used to support them. Let us take a review of the dungeons, whips, chains, racks, gibbets, in which every society is abundantly stored, by which hundreds of victims are annually offered up to support a dozen or two in pride and madness, in millions, in an abject servitude and dependence. 
He says the simplest form of government is despotism, where all the inferior orbs of power are moved merely by the will of the supreme, and all that are subject to them directed in the same manner merely by the occasional will of the magistrate. And he says that at last it swallows up every species of government. And he said that many of the greatest tyrants on the records of history have begun their reigns in the fairest manner. But the truth is, this unnatural power corrupts both the heart and the understanding. And to prevent the least hope of amendment, a king is ever surrounded by a crowd of infamous flatterers who find their account in keeping him from the least light of reason till all ideas of rectitude and justice are utterly erased from his mind. And he even says that let a sovereign do what he will, all his actions are just and lawful because they are his. And he puts that in quotes because this is what people think, like an authority figure can be exempted from morality. And he says, he grew every day a monster more abandoned to unnatural lust, to debauchery, to drunkenness, and to murder. And yet this was originally a great man of uncommon capacity and a strong propensity to virtue. But unbounded power proceeds step by step until it has eradicated every laudable principle. And he says, the greatest part of the governments on earth must be concluded tyrannies, impostures, violations of the natural rights of mankind, and worse than the most disorderly anarchies. How much other forms exceeds this we shall consider immediately. And then he goes over the different forms of government and he says a republic, as an ancient philosopher has observed, is no one species of government, but a magazine of every species. Here you find every sort of it and that in its worst form. And after reviewing many different states in history, he says, we are now at the close of our review of the three simple forms of artificial society. And we have shown them, however they may differ in name or in some slight circumstances, to be all alike in effect to be all tyrannies. Let us concede Athens, Rome, Carthage, and two or three more of the ancient as well as many of the modern commonwealths to have been or to be free and happy and to owe their freedom and happiness to their political constitution. Yet allowing all this, what defense does this make for artificial society in general that these inconsiderable spots of the globe have for some short space of time stood as exemptions to a charge so general? But when we call these governments free or concede that their citizens were happier than those which lived under different forms, it is merely ex abundi, And ex abundi means out of abundant caution. For we should be greatly mistaken if we really thought that the majority of the people which tilled these cities enjoyed even that nominal political freedom of which I have spoken so much already. In reality, they had no part of it. In Athens, there were usually from 10 to 30,000 freemen. This was the utmost, but the slaves usually amounted to 400,000 and sometimes to a great many more. The freemen of Sparta and Rome were not more numerous in proportion to those whom they held in a slavery more terrible than the Athenian. Therefore, state the matter fairly. The free states never formed, though they were taken altogether the thousandth part of the habitable globe. The freemen in these states were never the twentieth part of the people, and the time they subsisted is scarce anything in that immense ocean of duration in which time and slavery are to nearly commensurate. Therefore, call these free states or popular governments or what you please when we consider the majority of their inhabitants and regard the natural rights of mankind, they must appear in reality and truth no better than pitiful and oppressive oligarchies. And this affirms what we studied from Carl Jung when he says every government turns into oligarchy. So he says, after so fair an examine, wherein nothing has been exaggerated, no fact produced which cannot be proved, and none which has been produced in any wise forced or strained, while thousands have, for brevity, been omitted, after so candid a discussion in all respects, what slave so passive, what bigot so blind, what enthusiast so headlong, what politician so hardened as to stand up in defense of a system calculated for a curse to mankind, a curse under which they smart and groan to this hour without thoroughly knowing the nature of the disease and wanting understanding or courage to supply the remedy. 
He says the monarchic and aristocratical and popular partisans have been jointly laying their axes to the root of all government and have in their turns proved each other absurd and inconvenient. In vain you tell me that artificial government is good, but that I fall out only with the abuse. He says, the thing, the thing itself is the abuse. Observe, my lord, I pray you, that grand error upon which all artificial legislative power is founded. It was observed that men had ungovernable passions which made it necessary to guard against the violence they may offer to each other. They appointed governors over them for this reason, but a worse and more perplexing difficulty arises, how to be defended against the governors. He says, in a word, my lord, we have all seen, and if any outward considerations were worthy, the lasting concern of a wise man, we have some of us felt such oppression from party government as no other tyranny can parallel. And he's talking about the faulty nature of the party system. He says the government is one day arbitrary power in a single person, another a juggling confederacy of a few to cheat the prince and enslave the people, and the third a frantic and unmanageable democracy. And so he's saying that all these parties is the same, and they're all of the same spirit, he says. They're all of ambition, self-interest, of oppression, and treachery. And he says that that spirit entirely reverses all the principles which a benevolent nature has erected within us. All honesty, all equal justice, and even the ties of natural society to natural affections. So then, in concluding, he says he's done with looking at all the different forms of government. He says they have enlisted reason to fight against itself and employ its whole force to prove that it is an insufficient guide to them in the conduct of their lives. But unhappily for us, in proportion as we have deviated from the plain rule of our nature and turned our reason against itself, in that proportion we have increased the follies and miseries of humankind. He says, the more deeply we penetrate into the labyrinth of art, the further we find ourselves from those ends for which we entered it. This has happened in almost every species of artificial society and in all times. We found, or we thought we found, an inconvenience in having every man the judge of his own cause. Therefore, judges were set up at first with discretionary powers. But it was soon found a miserable slavery to have our lives and properties precarious and hanging upon the arbitrary determination of any one man or set of men. We fled to laws as a remedy for this evil. By these we persuaded ourselves we might know with some certainty upon what ground we stood, but lo, differences arose upon the sense and interpretation of these laws. Thus we were brought back to our old incertitude. New laws were made to expound the old, and new difficulties arose upon the new laws. As words multiplied, opportunities of cavilling upon them also. Then recourse was also had to notes, comments, glosses, reports and learn readings. Eagle stood against eagle, authority was set up against authority. Some were allured by the modern, others referenced the ancient. The new were more enlightened, the old more venerable. Some adopted the comment, others stuck to the text. The confusion increased, the mist thickened, until it could be discovered no longer what was allowed or forbidden, what things were in property, and what was common. In this uncertainty, uncertain even to the professors, the contending parties felt themselves more effectually ruined by the delay than they could have been by the injustice of any decision. Our inheritances have become a prize for disputation, and disputes and litigations have become an inheritance. So he says, the professors of artificial law have always walked hand in hand with the professors of artificial theology. As their end in confounding the reason of man and abridging his natural freedom is exactly the same, they have adjusted the means to that end in a way entirely similar. Ask of politicians the ends for which laws were originally designed, and they will answer that the laws were designed as a protection for the poor and weak against the oppression of the rich and powerful. But surely no pretense can be so ridiculous. A man might as well tell me he has taken off my load because he has changed the burden. 
if the poor man is not able to support his suit according to the vexatious and expensive manner established in civilized countries, has not the rich as great an advantage over him as the strong over the weak in a state of nature? But we will not place the state of nature, which is the reign of God, in competition with political society, which is the absurd usurpation of man. In a state of nature, it is true that a man of superior force may beat or rob me, but then it is true that I am at full liberty to defend myself or make reprisal by surprise or by cunning or by any other way in which I may be superior to him. But in political society, a rich man may rob me in another way, and I cannot defend myself, for money is the only weapon with which we are allowed to fight, and if I attempt to avenge myself, the whole force of that society is ready to complete my ruin. A good person once said that where mystery begins, religion ends. Cannot I say as truly at least of human laws that where mystery begins, justice ends? It is hard to say whether the doctors of law or divinity have made the greater advances in the lucrative business of mystery. The lawyers as well as the theologians have erected another reason besides natural reason, and the result has been another justice besides natural justice. They have so bewildered the world and the themselves in unmeaning forms and ceremonies and so perplex the plainest manners with metaphysical jargon that it carries the highest danger to a man out of that profession to make the least step without their advice and assistance. Thus, by confining to themselves the knowledge of the foundation of all men's lives and properties, they have reduced all mankind into the most abject and servile dependence. We are the tenants at the will of these gentlemen for everything, and a metaphysical quibble is to decide whether the greatest villain breathing shall meet his deserts or escape with impunity, or whether the best man in society shall not be reduced to the lowest and most despicable condition it affords. In a word, my lord, the injustice, delay, puerility, false refinement, and affected mystery of the law are such that many who live under it come to admire and envy the expedition, simplicity, and equality of arbitrary judgments. And he says, indeed, the blindness of one part of mankind cooperating with the frenzy and villainy of the other has been the real builder of this respectable fabric of political society. And as the blindness of mankind has caused their slavery, in return, their state of slavery is made a pretense for continuing them in a state of blindness. For the politician will tell you gravely that their life of servitude disqualifies the greater part of the race of man for a search of truth and supplies them with no other than mean and insufficient ideas. This is but true, and this is one of the reasons for which I blame such institutions, he says. He's not attacking a certain politician, he's not attacking a certain political party, he's not attacking a certain law, he's attacking the foundations to government. He says, thus, we are running in a circle without modesty and without end and making one error and extravagance in excuse for the other. Think of it like in medicine when we're giving pills to treat symptoms and we keep treating the symptom but never get to the root cause. He says, on the whole, if political society in whatever form has still made the many of the property of the few, if it has introduced labors unnecessary, vices and diseases unknown, and pleasures incompatible with nature, if in all countries it abridges the lives of millions and renders those of millions more utterly abject and miserable, shall we still worship so destructive an idol and daily sacrifice to it our health, our liberty, and our peace? literally saying that we're worshiping the government. He says, for the free governments, for the point of their space and the moment of their duration have felt more confusion and committed more flagrant acts of tyranny than the most perfect despotic governments which we have ever known. Saying things like constitutional republics are more dangerous than communist countries because the people don't realize they're being enslaved, perhaps. He says, the cause of artificial society is more defenseless even than that of artificial religion, that it is a derogatory from the honor of the creator, a subversive of human reason, and productive of infinitely more mischief to the human race. He says, show me any mischief produced by the madness or wickedness of theologians, and I will show you a hundred resulting from the ambition and villainy of conquerors and statesmen. Show me an absurdity in religion, and I will undertake to show you a hundred for one in political laws and institutions. If you say that natural religion is a sufficient guide without the foreign aid of revelation, on what principle should political laws become necessary? 
Is not the same reason available in theology and in politics? If the laws of nature are the laws of God, is it consistent with the divine wisdom to prescribe rules to us and leave the enforcement of them to the folly of human institutions? Will you follow truth but to a certain point? We are indebted for all our miseries to our distrust of that guide which providence thought sufficient for our condition, our natural own reason which, rejecting both in human and divine things, we have given our necks to the yoke of political and theological slavery. We have renounced the prerogative of man, and it is no wonder that we should be treated like beasts. But our misery is much greater than theirs, as the crime we commit in rejecting the lawful dominion of our reason is greater than any that which they can commit. In the end of this, he says, the nearer we approach to the goal of life, the better we begin to understand the true value of our existence and the real weight of our opinions. We set out much in love with both, but we leave much behind us as we advance. We first throw away the tails along with the rattles of our nurses. Those of the priest keep their hold a little longer, those of our governors the longest of all. But the passions which prop these opinions are withdrawn one after another. The cool light of reason at the setting of our life shows us what a false splendor played upon these objects during our more sanguine seasons. So he's telling us that there is a destiny for humankind and that humans are worshiping these forms of government and they're taking us over. There's this cycle where people are dependent and all these governments are playing on these mechanisms. The root cause that he is talking about, and when he says political slavery, that's literally what Lysander Spooner called it, and many others that I detail in my work, it's called statism. And if you don't know what statism is, I encourage you to learn about it. There is one page I made dedicated to the subject with the best documentaries on the internet, the best resources you need to know for it. This will actually get to the root cause, and no conservative that I know out there talks about it and even libertarians don't talk about it, it's because it has to do with our moral psychological self and changing ourselves. Many people want to point the finger, but it's time to point the finger at ourselves. This text, of course, covers religion, which whatever you think of that, we're particularly dealing with the political side of it at the moment, but we must take into account that the state does act as a religion, and we have a whole series on religion with Dr. Carl Jung's insights. You can check it out at theliberator.us slash religion. That's theliberator.us slash religion. It's important to note that the very first governments were set up, such as Samaria, so that the, the kings had a divine right to rule by God. So religion was used as an excuse to rule over other people. So that tie has always been there. That is true. And this writing is really just highlighting the difference between a natural religion or a natural government, a natural society versus that artificial, that which is created by man. Now, the solution is voluntarism and permaculture, two terms that most independent media, most conservatives, most people in politics are completely ignorant of. So you'll also learn about it on the liberator.us. Thank you very much for watching.